After two by-election batterings, he is under pressure once again. The Scottish Tory leader, Douglas Ross, is among those calling for the Prime Minister to go. He'll tell us why. And Covid is back with a vengeance. But is that a worry or is it just an inconvenience? We'll ask the National Clinical Director, Professor Jason Leach. After all of that, Andrew Black takes over this week on the radio right through until midday. Morning to you, Andrew. Hi there, Martin. Well, after this week's rail strikes, we're facing a summer of foreign air travel disruption. We'll tell you what to expect. And also, uh, the US is expected to outlaw abortion in around half of states following Friday's US Supreme Court ruling. We'll speak to the senior lawyer and equal rights campaigner, Baroness Helena Kennedy, about the global ramifications of the decision. All right, Andrew, thanks for that. More from you soon. So, loads to get through as ever, do stay with us. Yes, good morning indeed. I'm Martin Geisler. There is lots to discuss this morning and you can have your say all the way through the programme. The social media hashtag, as ever, is BBC Sunday Show. Do get in touch. Now then, let's start with a massive understatement this week, shall we? It has not been a good week for the Prime Minister. Two batterings in by-elections and the resignation of his party chairman. The former Tory leader, Michael Howard, has now said the country would be better off under new leadership. And all this less than three weeks after Boris Johnson won that vote of confidence among his party colleagues. Well, let's take a look in a bit more detail at what happened with those results on Thursday and what it might all mean. First, let's go to Wakefield. The Tories first won that seat uh, just three years ago in the 2019 general election. It had been solidly Labour right back to the 1930s. But Brexit, of course, changed the political map in the north of England and Mary Cray, a staunch Remainer, lost what had been a completely safe Labour seat. So now, with Brexit done, are traditional red voters going home politically? Well, Maybe, but pollsters reckon it would have been a really bad night for Labour if they hadn't taken Wakefield back. But if the Tories took some consolation from that, there was absolutely none to be found for them in Devon. The Tiverton and Honiton result was a straightforward disaster for the Conservative Party. This was the very definition of a safe seat for them, and now it's gone. A 30% swing in the vote gave the Liberal Democrats the seat, and they had six thousand votes to spare. But look a little deeper into the figures and an even more interesting story begins to emerge because Labour came second in Tiverton and Honiton in the last two elections but this week they lost their deposit and the Lib Dems came from virtually nowhere to take a seat they'd never held before. So with no real evidence that Labour's popularity is slumping generally across the country or that the Lib Dems are enjoying some kind of dramatic explosive return, does all this suggest something bigger is going on, perhaps? Are we looking at a, a straight calculation emerging in constituencies in England? The Tories versus whoever's best place to beat the Tories. And if so, what might that mean for the Prime Minister? and for the rest of the UK? Well, let's put those questions, shall we, to the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party, Douglas Ross, who joins us live now. Good morning, Mr Ross. Morning. Ah, right, I see we have a delay on the line, which is always uh, a bit of a problem, but let's get through this as best we can, shall we? First question, very simple one. How much trouble's your party in at the moment? Well, I think Oliver Dowden's resignation shows that these are very disappointing results, as you've explained, in different parts of the country uh, against different opposition. I never want to see the Conservative losing seats at all, but both results are uh, very difficult for us, and the Prime Minister and the party have to reflect on that. And as Oliver Dowden said, it cannot be business as usual. So what does that mean? How do you fix it? Is, is Michael Howard right? Does the Prime Minister now have to go? Well, I made that clear three weeks ago when, in the vote of no confidence, I came to the conclusion that I didn't have confidence in the Prime Minister, uh, and I was joined by 147 other Conservative MPs uh, who made that point. 40% of the parliamentary party didn't have confidence in the Prime Minister. Uh, so I think that is uh, a growing frustration both within the parliamentary party uh, and, as we've seen in these by-elections, within the public as well. Yeah, well, with respect, Mr Ross, you haven't been entirely clear on this. You've been, uh, if I might suggest, all over the shop because you were loyal to him then you were a rebel, then you were a loyalist, now you're a rebel again. Uh, uh, what about Ukraine? F 50 
cruise missiles pumped into Ukraine on Friday night overnight. Vladimir Putin now giving Iskander missiles, which are capable of carrying nuclear warheads to his allies. This is a really worrying time there. That was the reason you said Boris Johnson couldn't go. What's changed? Well, as I said at the time of the no-confidence vote, the timing of it was not of my choosing. I didn't put in a letter to the 1922 committee because I thought the timing was wrong. However, under the current rules, we have an a election every year, potentially, in terms of no-confidence in the Prime Minister. And when that was put in front of me, because 15% or more of my parliamentary colleagues put in a letter to the 1922 committee, eh, I had to vote one way or another. Eh, and I had to vote that I didn't have confidence in the Prime Minister. Eh, and that does seem to be reflected not just in these by-election results but what we saw in local government results across the UK uh, in May as well. OK, but the people who voted like you lost, your side lost that debate, but you think he still has to go. So what happens now? What mechanism needs to be put in place to dislodge him? Well, we know that Theresa May had more support from her parliamentary colleagues when she faced a vote of no confidence, eh, and she resigned eh, just a few months later. So it's not just a, a situation where that vote is done and dusted and everyone moves on, because clearly the public, and these two by-elections in particular, eh, have not moved on. And we've seen now a resignation of the party chair who sits, or did sit, in Cabinet up until Friday morning. So this is a decision colleagues continue to look at, eh, and the Prime Minister must reflect on. Well, he says he's not going to reflect on it. He couldn't have made that clearer at all. He said he is never going to change and he's never going to resign. And he's looking at staying in Downing Street, by the way, until the mid-2030s. So what do you do about that? Well, that's a choice for the public, and the public have made their views known in these well, two Well, it's not. It's a choice for your party, unless you want to lose the next election, isn't it? And I've made my choice, Martin. I've made my choice very clear, along with 147 other colleagues. And yeah, it's and, now and, and it didn't work, and you didn't get rid of him. So what, so what do you do now? Those round the cabinet table. Well, as I was saying, it's up to the whole parliamentary party, and in particular those closest to him, those sitting around the cabinet table, to look at the impact this is having not just on the party, but on the country as a whole. Right, he's out of the country at the moment. He's away in Rwanda. He then goes to NATO. Then he goes to the G8. He doesn't come back until the end of the week. I mean, th there's a long history of leaders leaving the country and coming back to find some kind of revolt going on in their ranks. It happened to Margaret Thatcher. Is that what should happen to Boris Johnson? Does the cabinet need to, to galvanise and organise and coordinate something for his return? Well, I think clearly there will be discussions amongst colleagues. Oliver Dowden uh, is a very well-respected colleague. He was a very good party chairman and secretary of state before that. And he will have spoken to others, I'm sure, uh, since his uh, resignation. Uh, and members, uh, as I say, particularly those close to the prime minister, will have to look at what is the best situation for the country. And we cannot continue to keep on going, losing election after election, as we have in these two by-elections and the difficult results that the party faced in the local government elections in early May. So, listen, look, it, it, the there, whatever, whatever the cabinet say, he's made it pretty clear he's not going to listen. He's wanted this job his whole life. He's not about to give it up when he thinks there's a, a glimmer of a chance that things could get better. You're in the 1922 committee, the backbench group. Do, do you think they should change their rules and, and hold another vote? Well, I'm a member of the 1922 committee, but I'm not on the executive, and it's for the executive to look at rule changes. And clearly there is an election, I think, next week or the week after. And some candidates, their pitch is that they would change the rules. I personally don't think we should change the rules midway through a process. I think that's the wrong way to do it. Uh, but as we saw with Theresa May, <coughs> excuse me, she lost a vote of the 1922 committee, and it didn't take a rule change. She looked at the situation a few months on, and she stood down herself. Will you lose the next general election if Boris Johnson is still leader of, uh, the leader of your party? Party. Well, I'm not looking at that, Martin. We've got probably more than two years to go until the next general election. And the biggest issue for me is the priorities that the government, both here in Scotland and across the UK, should be focusing on, which is the cost of living crisis eh, and all the issues that are facing our NHS, education, justice, local government. Eh, and I think at the moment we're not able to eh, get that debate up forefront, for example, on this show, because I'm discussing Boris Johnson and his premiership, rather than the real issues that affect people right across the country. All right. I mean, some would argue that it's exactly, in fact, the people of Tiverton and Honiton said it was those issues that they don't trust you with anymore. They don't trust Boris Johnson to run the economy, and that's why the, the cost of living crisis was, was at the top of their list of concerns. But you're right. Let's uh, move the bandwidth or move the, use the airtime to discuss something else. Nicola Sturgeon is going to set out the roadmap to a second independence referendum 
on Tuesday. Are you interested to hear what she's going to have to say about that? Well, look, I'm not going to play Nicola Sturgeon's games on this issue. I'm going to take no part in her pretend referendum when there's real work to be done, real work to tackle the cost of living crisis in Scotland, real work to support our NHS, real work to improve our educational standards, real work to get our justice system back on the side of the victims rather than the culprits, making sure that local government has the support it needs to deliver essential services. These are all the priorities I hear from voters right across the country, not another independence referendum okay. for Sturgeon just wants to divide us all but, over again. But let me remind you, uh, your party didn't win the last Scottish election and the party with another referendum in their manifesto did, quite convincingly. So to call it a pretend referendum is pretty insulting, isn't it, to at least 50% of the electorate? No, because I think even Nicola Sturgeon said the 2014 referendum was the gold standard. That was with the agreement of the UK government with a Section 30 order. Now, we know that Nicola Sturgeon has not even asked for another Section 30 order, uh, yet she is going forward with her plans to hold another referendum when it's not the right time, it's not the priority of people across Scotland, when there are so many other pressing issues that the government and politicians of all parties should be focused on. Right. It, it, let, let me ask you this. If, if you believe in any kind of parliamentary democracy, and this, gets, this bill gets passed through Parliament, which we should assume it will, by the SNP and the Greens, and it is agreed by a court, which it may well be, you then have to fight a referendum, don't you, if you're any kind of a Democrat? Will you do that if those two things happen? Well, those are two very big ifs, Martin. Well, First no, the of parliamentary all, one, isn't it? If it'll sail through. So the court, thing is, the, the court issue is an if, but I'm asking you an if. If it does, will you well, fight a referendum? Well, Martin, the big if there for the parliamentary side is before it gets to vote, is if the prime minister, uh, sorry, the uh, presiding officer, officer passes officer, it. Uh, let's assume, let's assume those two things happen. Let's assume those two things happen. It gets through parliament well, and it gets through the court. Those are big assumptions, fight Martin. If I can just say. Well, Martin, if I can just say, those are really big ifs, because the Constitution is reserved under the Scotland Act of 1998 to the UK Parliament, which is why in 2014 it took a Section 30 order from the UK Government to allow a gold standard, in Nicola Sturgeon's words, a referendum to be held. And anything without that, I think, would just be a waste of time, a waste of resources, and not the priorities that people across Scotland expect their politicians to be focused on. Do you think the democratically elected government of a country should be allowed to ask the people of that country their opinion on a question. As simple as that. Because they're not promising independence, they're promising a referendum well, on independence. But they have been promising an independence of re on, ref uh, on independence every year since they lost in 2014. Uh, and since then, we have seen major challenges for the country coming out of the COVID pandemic. You're speaking to uh, colleagues later on today about on your programme about the spiking cases. We've got the problems with businesses in Scotland. We know there's issues in education, health, justice, etc. I think the Government of Scotland should be focused on these issues, not trying to divide Scotland all over again on a constitutional question okay. that was answered in 2014. Let me try this another way. The United Nations sees it as a basic human right, that the people of a country uh, should have a right to self-determination if they want it. Presumably you don't disagree with that. So what's the pathway of the people of Scotland to independence, if not through a referendum? Well, we know that the people of Scotland were given a choice in 2014, whether they wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom or to be separated yeah, from the Yeah, and they were told the that they should, stay, they should choose no to stay in Europe, and all that's changed. Everything has changed, Mr Ross. So, if the people of Scotland want self-determination, and that is their human right, how do they get it? Well, I was explaining, Martin, there has been that opportunity for people to express their views, but also you will know that in, I think, almost every opinion poll recently, no one is looking for another independence referendum in the timescale that the First Minister is putting forward. To say that she wants to divide Scotland all over again in October next that year... That doesn't really matter. She had it in her manifesto reckless. and she won the election based on that manifesto. But she didn't get an overall majority, and that's because she did with the, the, the pro-independence parties. Did. Best ever result. 
Yeah, but she also said during the election when uh, Alex Salmond was offering her a supermajority, you shouldn't game the system like that. And I agree, you know, we shouldn't be gaming a system to try and just get uh, another independence referendum through that way. Let's look at the priorities the government have in front of them today. That is a very big inbox that Nicola Sturgeon has to deal with. Uh, and I think an independence referendum is very low down people's priorities when there are far more okay. pressing issues for the country. Uh, a lot of people will be thinking, probably quite rightly this morning, that they've heard all of this before. These are the same questions and the same answers. I tell you what we don't hear very often from you or people in your position is the positive case for the union where is that why aren't you just why aren't you promoting it why aren't you fighting it and if you believe in it so much why don't you just put it to the people well, you very rarely ask me, Martin, but given the opportunity, a, a positive case for the union was our vaccination scheme. The fact that we are seeing uh, a, a spike in cases, you know, the vaccinations that we had across Scotland were part of the United Kingdom. We were able to procure and develop vaccines far quicker than any other part of Europe or indeed many other parts of the world. We were able to do that because of the might of the United Kingdom. We've got £37 billion pounds of additional support coming in uh, as a result of the Chancellor's decisions to help with the cost of living crisis. These are all benefits of being part of a strong uh, economic and political union of the United Kingdom and I'm happy to defend that any day. Oh well, are you? Let's see. Let's see if uh, you get the opportunity to defend that. It will probably end up in the courts and we will no doubt inevitably be back discussing this again. But in the meantime, Douglas Ross, thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, mention of vaccinations takes me to our next subject.